Hi, I'm the Lockpick in Cuba. You may have already seen the video in which I unboxed this, Melinda Green's amazing four-dimensional 2x2x2x2. Two by two by two by two. In this video, I'm going to at attempt to explain what this puzzle really is and how it works. As you'll hopefully have seen from my previous video, the puzzle is made up of 16 cubes held together with magnets, and each of these cubes has four colours on it. So this one, for example, is white, pink, red, and blue. So let's compare that with a regular 2x2x2, two by two by two, the three-dimensional puzzle, which has eight cubes, four on the top and four on the bottom, each of which has three colours. So the three-dimensional puzzle has three colours on each piece, and the four-dimensional puzzle has four colours on each piece. Um, if we made a two-dimensional puzzle like this, it would be a two by two consisting of four squares, each of which would have two colours, one on each side. So there's a progression here. If we have an n-dimensional puzzle, the puzzle is made up of two to the n pieces, each of which has n faces on it, and thus n colours. So with a three-dimensional two by two by two, there's two faces for each of the three dimensions. So a total of six faces on a cube, and as a result, the puzzle has a total of six colours. If we could make a four-dimensional hypercube, 2x2x2x2, two by two by two by two, there'd be two faces for each of its four dimensions, so a total of eight faces, meaning we'd have a total of eight colours. And although this isn't actually four-dimensional, because like you, I live in a three-dimensional world, it does have all of the same mathematical properties. We have a total of eight colours, so we have the same colours as on the 2x2x2, two by two by two, plus pink uh, and purple. And you can see that in this puzzle, which is a 3D representation of a 4D object, the yellow and white faces are represented by these corner pieces. So in a geometrically correct four-dimensional puzzle, these corner pieces would be connected together into a single white hyperface and a single yellow hyperface. But the genius of what Melinda Green, who invented this puzzle, has done is that she's arranged a set of three-dimensional pieces such that if you move them in the right ways relative to each other, you have a puzzle that scrambles and solves just like the four-dimensional equivalent would do. Think of it like this. A cubic puzzle has square two-dimensional faces. So a four-dimensional hypercubic puzzle has faces which are cubes, uh, three-dimensional. So each of those faces would be made up of eight cubes, just like this regular two by two by two. Um, so on a regular two by two by two, we take three of these square faces and combine them together to make a corner piece like this one which is white red green for example on the two by two by two we take four cubic faces and combine them together to make a corner piece like this one which is itself a hypercube with four colors so yellow pink red and green and that's what we have with each of these physical pieces in this puzzle the best way to understand it that i've seen is a short video by joel carlson which i'll uh, add in the various links below the puzzle didn't actually start out in this form. It started out as a piece of software, which Melinda Green and Don Hatch created in the late 1980s. You can still download it today. I'll leave a link in the description. It's called Magic Cube 4D, and the website describes it as a fully functional four-dimensional analog of Rubik's Cube, plus dozens of other beautiful 4D puzzles. So here we have the software. This is the 3x3x3x3. Three by three by three by three. Um, you can see that each face is actually made up of a cube of cubes, um, like this purple one here. Um, there are eight colours, but we can only see seven of them, and that's because the eighth colour is uh, on an axis that is sort of invisible to us. We can rotate the puzzle, as I'll show you in a second, to bring that um, axis into view, and that's similar to doing a gyro move. You can also rotate layers, just like a normal Rubik's Cube, like this, um, and like this. And if we keep rotating them around, they all just get back to the beginning where they started. We can also rotate this kind of inner um, cube of cubes. And then there's this rather complicated rotation as well. Uh, and then if I yeah, control click on one of these edges, then I do this rotation. It's a little bit like a gyro where I get to bring in one of the colors that you couldn't see previously. So that was the three by three by three by three. Um, we've got a whole range of other puzzles, but the other one I wanted to show you is the 2x2x2x2, two by two by two by two, which is the one that is uh, equivalent to the puzzle that Melinda has made. Um, in the real world that we're looking at in this video. And it, it works in very much the same kind of way. We can click on these pieces um, to rotate the puzzle, um, get different views of it. Um, we can also rotate layers. If you'd like to read the full story of how Melinda took this from software to a seemingly impossible physical reality, I recommend checking out her superliminal website where she gives the full history and a lot more detailed information about this puzzle, including a hall of fame of all the people who've ever solved this physical version. So how do you solve a four-dimensional two by two by two by two. In fact, 
how do you scramble it? So this is one of the first things you'll notice about this puzzle when you get hold of it. Unlike regular Rubik's cubes, which are constrained by their mechanisms, with this puzzle you can theoretically move any piece anywhere you like, because they're just held together by magnets. So I can pull that out and I can put it where that piece is, for example. Um, the magnets have an orientation which stops me from putting pieces in the wrong way around like this, but I can put it in like that, for example. But if you want to treat this as a three-dimensional analogue of the four-dimensional puzzle, you have to constrain yourself to moves that would be possible on the four-dimensional version. We call these canonical moves or legal moves. And here are the moves you can do. First of all, you can take the two halves of the puzzle and rotate them relative to each other like this. Or you can rotate them relative to each other in this way. In fact, you can just take them apart from each other and jumble them around and put them back together any way you like. So that constitutes a legal move. And as you'll see when I uh, show you how I solve it, this is very useful um, for solving the puzzle. Um, next, you can take one of these uh, one by two by four slices and rotate it by 180 degrees like that. So this has kind of switched these yellow corners with these white corners down here. And this is a twist of this hyperface. Next, you can rotate this face that's hidden in the middle. So this is the blue face in here. Um, to rotate that face, you have to rotate both of these layers at the same time. So the way I usually do that is by twisting actually the top and bottom layers at the same time. It is possible, and lots of people do it, where they twist this pair, middle pair, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so I don't do it that way. Now notice what you can't do is this. This is not a legal move. If I want to move one of these end caps, I have to move the other end cap the same direction and the same number of turns. And the reason for that is that these green centers here are actually logically connected together on the four-dimensional um, hypercube. Okay, finally, there's a uh, rather complicated move called a gyro, which has a very simple result, as I'll explain, uh, and it looks like this. And notice that I'm using a bunch of illegal moves here, but they end up adding up to a single legal move called the gyro. So what we've done is we've taken the uh, yellow and white faces which were on these corners, which is kind of like the outer uh, fourth dimensional um, axis on the, on the four dimensional puzzle. And we brought that into this axis here. And then when we switched it with this orange and red axis, which is now that one there. And this is actually not changing the state of the puzzle. Although it looks different to us, the four dimensional puzzle is still in the same state. It's exactly equivalent to taking a puzzle like a two by two by two and just rotating it. We haven't actually changed the state of the puzzle. We've just turned it around. And the same kind of thing has happened here, although it looks rather different. OK, so how do you scramble the puzzle? Um, in fact, before we scramble it, what we need to talk about is what is the solved state of this puzzle? Well, right now, this is in a solved state. Uh, and there's actually only one solved state for the four dimensional two by two by two by two. But in this three dimensional analog, it, the states can look different. So the state it was in when these corners were white and yellow was also solved. And now with these orange and red corners, it's still solved. We can also twist the cubes like this, and this is still solved. And again, all we've really done is rotate the puzzle. So for this to be solved, we need identical colors on the top and bottom faces here and here, which are actually the same four dimensional face as you can see by rotation like this, boom, boom. Um, similarly, we need op identical colors opposite to the top colors hidden in the middle here. So the opposites are just like on a standard Rubik's cube where we have white opposite yellow, blue opposite green, red opposite orange, and the same is true here, but we also have purple opposite pink. So in the middle here, we need this uh, green, which is opposite blue. And then we need to have these colors be the same as each other in these complete sets and the opposite colors over here and the same here. So purple opposite pink, white opposite yellow. So this is the solved state um, of the puzzle. To scramble it, you can just do a series of canonical moves, but actually it turns out there's a really nice way to scramble it that involves doing illegal moves, which lead to a legal state. So the illegal moves that we do are we take this top end cap and put it on the bottom, we take the right hand face and move it over to the left, and then we just do an arbitrary rotation of the two cubes relative to each other like this. Um, and this ends up with a, a legal state, even though those first two moves aren't uh, canonical. So to scramble it, we just keep repeating that process over and over again. Uh, 
Okay, I'll consider this scrambled now. So there we go, that's what the uh, two by two by two by two looks like when it's in its uh, scrambled state. Okay. So that's the best explanation I can offer for this puzzle. Once you start to realize what it really is and what solving it really means, it is kind of mind blowing. At least it blew my mind anyway. And while it would be perfectly possible to learn to solve this puzzle without understanding its connection to the 4D counterpart, uh, I do think that having that understanding completely changes the experience from an interesting one to an absolutely bewitching one. You're not just solving a three-dimensional puzzle, you're literally solving a four-dimensional puzzle in three-dimensional space. Uh, to me, that's just incredible. In the final video in this series, I'll run through a solve of the puzzle. So do watch that one if you're interested to see what it's like to solve the video. Thanks for watching, and I'll uh, hope to see you in the next video. Bye.